Okay, so in this video I'm going to introduce the concept of a flow net and I'm going to do so through the use of a fairly straightforward and somewhat typical problem we see in geotechnical engineering where we apply the flow net to calculate seepage. So a typical problem might look something like this where I have a, um, a difference in elevation of water on two sides of a barrier. In general, this is the simplest type of problem we see where we really just have a single barrier. Here it's shown as a sheet pile wall. And uh, on one side we have the, the soil, and the soil is quite a high elevation on, on the one side, and a water table below the surface of the soil. On the other side we have a lower elevation of the soil, and then we have a water depth so I'm indicating the water with the, the typical symbol that we use for the water elevation um, on both sides. And as you can see, we have a difference in water elevation of 2.5 meters. Now, one of the things that we often do in these problems is that we set the reference elevation or datum, if possible and convenient, we will set it to be equal to the elevation of the low water side. And that just makes the calculation a bit simpler uh, in terms of elevation head. So remember, in a flow net, we're going to be using total head, and that's comprised of a pressure component and an elevation component. And if we simply set the low water table to the zero elevation, then quite simply the difference between the high water and low water is, is, is just whatever that distance, uh, that becomes the, we know that that's the total head difference. Okay, so, uh, so the next thing I'll do is I will attempt to actually draw the flow net, and it's important to realize the flow net only exists where there is water and soil. So I, I don't have a flow net up here because there's no water. Um, I, I don't have a flow net in here because there's no soil. So the flow net will only exist where the actual seepage is occurring. So this, the flow net will start uh, at the water table inside the soil on this side, and it will the water will flow around the tip of the sheet pile and up, and the flow net will stop here in the soil. The flow net does not continue into just the water. The other thing I'll say right off the bat is that the first step in doing a proper flow net analysis is to draw the problem to scale. And um, my, my drawing here on the light board is not perfectly to scale, but it's not bad. Uh, you can probably do a little bit better job on a, a sheet of paper with a scale or a ruler. Uh, but in concept, this should, this should do the trick. So I'm going to go ahead and, and try and draw that. For, first things to notice before you draw is, of course, what I just said, you know, where is the flow net going to start and stop? And for us, it's going to sort of go from this water elevation up to this soil elevation because that's where the seepage is occurring. We also assume that the water below the water table in the soil is saturated. That's a simplifying assumption um, that sort of is important. The other important assumptions are that the soil is homogeneous and isotropic, meaning that the soil is the same everywhere and that the properties, particularly the hydraulic conductivity or uh, coefficient of permeability, are the same in all directions in the soil. Okay. Um, the, and, and the other thing, too, is just to notice some of our boundary conditions. Boundary conditions is just a fancy way of saying, you know, what are the constraints in the drawing? And, of course, the sheet pile wall will be uh, a major constraint. And the other thing to note is this impervious layer on the bottom. So our flow net will not go through the impervious layer. This is where we assume that seepage will not occur. Okay, and this could be a rock layer or um, a clay layer, and perhaps this is a sand layer or something that will have um, uh, more seepage flowing through it or higher uh, hydraulic conductivity or coefficient of permeability. So, so when you draw the flow net, um, you know, I, I tell people that the simplest thing is to, to just go for it, and drawing the flow channels 
is probably the best place to start. And uh, the, the flow channels are really just created by flow lines. And I'll give it, I'll, I'll try and draw one here. And, and I, I think you can kind of see, see that the water is gonna flow down around the tip of this sheep pile and up. And, and, and what I've done is essentially create a flow channel by drawing what we call a flow line. And then I'll try and draw another one. And, and you have to try to make it sort of get a bit smaller when it squeezes through smaller spaces. And then maybe I can squeeze in uh, a third one. And, and, and I've sort of on purpose drawn this one crazy close to the impervious layer. That's not really ideal, but it will, I'll use this to illustrate a point uh, that I like to make and where I see students often make mistakes drawing their flow lines. Um, so that, that's, so now I've got some flow channels. Now I'm going to try and draw my equipotential lines. And, and it's important to realize that the equipotential lines are joining points of equal total head. And there's some rules for drawing our equipotential lines and our flow lines. The main one being that all of the equipotential lines have to cross the flow lines at right angles. So I'll, 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 I'll again just kind of go for it here. I'm going to draw, I'll draw one and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so there's one equipotential line. Now, technically, this water surface, the water table in the soil is also an equipotential line because that, that water surface is really joining points or the line representing the water surface is joining points of equal total head. But what we need to do is we need to go from this value of total head, which is 2.5 meters uh, of total head, down to this equipotential line, which is really which is really zero total head. So if you look uh, reference reference to the datum, we have we have four meters of pressure head, but we have negative four meters of elevation head. So really, we've got an equipotential equipotential line here that's zero and an equipotential line here that's 2.5. And the equipotential lines that I draw between this line and this line will all represent equal uh, decrements, equal divisions of decreasing total head. Okay, and, and what, I, what I drew here is not bad. I mean, I, I can put a little symbol in here to indicate that I've, I've tried to draw that at, uh, at, at a right angle to the flow line. And I'll carry on trying to draw these. And, and what you might notice is that uh, I'm trying to follow another rule, and that is as much as possible, I'm trying to make these elements um, squares. And a good way to test is whether or not you can sort of inscribe a circle into these elements. Now, that, that one's not perfect, but for the purpose of a flow net, it's probably good enough. Uh, and and the other thing too is that the the equipoten equipotential lines should also uh, touch all of the barriers also at a right angle. That one's not not the greatest. And the flow lines, you know, should also be at right angles to that first equipotential line. So don't start these, you know, on an angle. They really do need to start at a ninety degree angle to that sort of uh, that first flow uh, equipotential line. I'm going to try and, and carry on here. And notice I'm also going to cross the impervious barrier at a 90 degree angle. I didn't do a very good job there. And one of the, the things when you draw flow nets is that you should use a pencil and an eraser. And, and what I just did there is a good illustration of why. And it does also take practice to draw these. Now, some of these are not perfect squares, but again, the idea is to make them as close as possible to a square. And you can try that inscribed circle test uh, as a check and I'll carry on but by the way if you have a, a flow net that has some uh, that has symmetry to it uh, and you have a barrier like this it's always a good bet to draw just a sort of a straight line down the middle because you know that if I have symmetry then I, I, I'll, I can stick a flow line uh, in the middle uh, and, and that should be okay um, takes a little bit of practice to draw these. I don't have symmetry here, so I'm having to sort of uh, do a little bit more of improvisation. Okay, and this one, 
I would say that that flow net uh, turned out not too badly. Uh, I'll erase this circle here just because it might be a little distracting. But provided we followed all of the rules of drawing the flow net, what I have here is a valid, uh, a valid procedure for the next thing, which is calculating what is the actual seepage through this. And to calculate seepage, we're going to need to know what the value of k is. Uh, and we're also going to need to count our flow channels and our equipotential lines. So uh, you can look at this and you can say, oh, well, there's three, there's three flow channels. You know, one flow channel, two flow channels, three flow channels. But I don't quite have three flow channels. I have a little bit more. So when you come down here and you look at my last flow line, notice I... I I just kind of squeaked past that impervious layer. Well, in actual fact, there's another flow channel that goes through here. But if you think about the rule of trying to draw these elements so that they're squares, what I have left over here is sort of a fraction of a flow line. And it's okay to, to look at what a square would have been here and say, well, what fraction of a square do I have left over? And I can call this outside flow channel that fraction. So I might say that I've actually got a tenth of, of an element here. It may be even less than that, but I'll just call it a tenth. And I'll say that I have uh, 3.1 flow channels. Uh, and we, we, we call that NF. Maybe I'll put it up here. Number of flow channels, NF is equal to 3.1 according to what I've drawn in this flow net. Now, the equipotential drops, we call that ND, the D for drops, I guess. Um, we count those sort of starting at zero. That's how, how I do it. I say, well, I'm going from here over to here, and how many times will I drop the pressure as I come through ultimately ending at zero. So I'll count the flow lines like this. I'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's a nice round number to end off with. Uh, so basically I have 3.1 flow channels or flow tubes. Some textbooks call them flow tubes. And I have 10 equipotential drops. Um, if I knew what the K was, and maybe we could give this problem a K, let's say it's 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5, and that's usually, we'll say that that's in meters per second, then calculating the flow through this flow net really just involves applying the the total head difference, like what's the total head, and, and, that, and, and that's easy. For this one, it's just 2.5 meters. And the way we calculate the flow through the flow net is really through a very simple, we would just say Q, the flow, is equal to K H times the number of uh, flow channels divided by the number of drops. And the important thing to realize is that in this part of the equation, it's really the ratio of the flow channels to the drops that is important because that value will be reduced to whatever the fraction is. And sometimes people say, well, how do I know how many flow channels to, to draw? It really doesn't matter. As long as you follow the rules of drawing the flow net, you should end up with the same ratio here in the formula and hence the same value for the total flow. Now, uh, you, you can calculate what this is. Uh, you just multiply, you know, uh, H times K times the ratio of 3.1 over 10, and you'll end up with some value Q for, for flow. And the Q, if you work out the units, the Q would actually be in um, meters squared per second. And you might say, well, well, what does what is meters squared per second? This this is unitless. This has the units of meters, and this has the units of meters per second. That's our hydraulic conductivity. So you might say, well, how, how can a volume of flow be in square meters? Well, it's really not in square meters. 
what we've done is we've taken a 2D slice through what is really a three-dimensional problem. And the way I like to think of it is that this slice has a unit depth or a unit um, width to the, to the slice. So really we end up with, with a, a value that is in cubic meters per second per meter. And that's how I like to write it sometimes. And, and the way I explain it is I say, well, the, the, the per meter cancels one of the cubic meters so that we end up with, with what is truly shown by the, the units of the, the parameters of the formula in meters squared. But we can still express it in cubic meters per second per meter as our total seepage. Um, what you then do is, if you know the length of this sheet pile wall, sort of in and out of the light board, then to get the total volume of seepage for the whole uh, site, we would just multiply whatever you get for Q, multiply by the number of meters in and out of the board, and you would get the total volume in cubic meters per second. So uh, this is an explanation of how you would do a typical flow net problem. I uh, hope you found it helpful, and uh, good luck drawing your own flow nets.